Grab your Bibles, turn them open to Acts and the 16th chapter and the 16th verse. And I love, I love days like today. Um, I just want to remind everybody as we get started, the, the rumors have already ran. Uh, no, I don't have anybody planned to exercise on the stage today. I mean, if you'll come work out with me tomorrow, that's, we can work that out, like, if you want. But no, I don't, like, we don't have, I don't have anybody that I know is demonically possessed that I'm planning on calling out. I don't know if there's any witches in the church or something of that nature. That's not what I mean by exposing demonic possession. And also, I need to tell you that this is not a publicity stunt. That was accused of me yesterday that this was all for publicity. There's no publicity here. How long have you been with me? How, some of you, how, how long, if you've been in here for six months, would you put your hands up? If you've been in here for a year, would you put your hands up? Two years? If you've been in here for two years, you've been in here for a year, six months, how, how much do you know that what we do here is we go right through the book of the Bible? Yes. Yes. Is that what we do? Yes. Then this came up. I didn't do this. No, no publicity stunt. We're not trying to gain followers. We're not trying to gain people to come to church. Well, obviously, we want people to be saved. We want to add to the kingdom. We want to further the kingdom. But all I want to do today is look at what God's word says and be obedient to that. You can, you can clap for that. But this is a topic. When I've told you before I'm a bad Baptist, this is what we mean. Some of you know and some of you are like, I don't really know anything about Baptists. Well, I know some Baptists who wouldn't, who wouldn't take a text like this. They would avoid the hard truth. Today we're going to talk about demonic possession. I, I, for sake of like getting it onto a, a graphic, I left out some other words there. But you could... You could Add to that oppression, and you could add to that influence. You could say demonic influence, you could say demonic oppression, and you could say demonic possession. All of those are true. And uh, today we're going to expose that. We're going to talk about that from the scriptures. What, does, what do the scriptures say? When I was uh, seven years old, this first part of what I'm going to tell you, I'm, everybody always wants to know, ask me later, and I'll tell you later. I have to keep it brief. When I was about seven, we were on our way to North Carolina. We were going for a trip. It'd be the first time I would ever get to see the beach. And before we even made it out of Kentucky, my brother, my oldest brother, Matt, he said, Dad, Justin's blue. My dad looked in the back seat, and I was convulsing, and I was having a grand mal seizure. I died for four minutes. At least that's what they tell me. I don't know. I didn't time it. But they tell me that I died for four minutes. They pulled over to the gas station. They pulled me out, set me on top of the car. I do remember a little bit of that. I woke up when I was at the gas station, but then I went back out when paramedics got there. No vital signs, no heartbeat, no breathing. I was gone. They resuscitated me back to life at seven years old. I was in the hospital for a short amount of time. They did a spinal tap on me. I couldn't hardly walk. After the spinal tap, they, my dad took me home. I remember my dad having to carry me into the house and put me on the bed. About a week later, my dad, for about a week, had to carry me to the table and set me at the table because I couldn't walk after the spinal tap. It hurt so bad. And about a week later, my friend Anthony is staying the night, and we were all playing Mortal Kombat on the Super Nintendo, and I fell asleep. And the next thing I know from my perspective, I began... Well, I didn't know this at the time, but I began to have a, a, a night terror. Has anybody ever experienced a child with a night terror? A night terror, if you've not experienced that, let me explain it to you. I don't want to explain too much. I'm not trying to be graphic, but I'm telling you that it's extremely graphic for the person experiencing it. It's a mix between a nightmare and a hallucination. There's no part of it that's, you know, hallucination could be something that you're seeing that's not really going on, but a night terror is when that is like a nightmare that you're literally experiencing or in your mind you're experiencing. For me, the first time that happened, there was this giant monster creature that was outside of my bedroom window, and he was pounding on the outside of our house. And I'm telling you, from my perspective, as real as real could be, the ceiling was caving in, the lights were coming down, and my brother and my friend who were there in the room, they turned around with these very demonic looking faces and they had claws and fangs and it was the most terrifying thing. And I tried to run. I literally tried to run and I'm screaming and running and the monster thing that was outside of the house was now inside. And when I ripped open the door, he grabbed me and pinned me to the ground. And at seven years old, I am fighting for my life only to wake up. And it was my dad on top of me. And he's saying, Justin, Justin. And I look over and my friend and my brother are standing there and they're just shocked. That continued to happen for the next five years of my life. 
so bad that for about three years, I couldn't stay the night at a friend's house. I couldn't have them stay the night at my house because we didn't know if Justin was going to have a crazed night terror and go screaming across the house, trying to get out, trying to escape, what was going to happen. I can't tell you the number of times I woke up with my dad or my brothers literally holding me down as I'm fighting for my life, having some crazy hallucination. And my parents, because I'd had a seizure, they're talking to all these doctors. And the doctor said, well, Justin, you have a problem with electrolytes. You don't have enough electrolytes. And so they told my mom to make sure that I drank plenty of Gatorade before I would go to bed. And so every night before I would go to bed, I would down some Gatorade. And I would still continue to have night terrors. Then they said, well, it's the video games. You re- he, that happened after he played video games. It's all the flashing lights. No video games after six o'clock at night. That went down to five o'clock and then four o'clock. And then all of a sudden my mom says, nope, no video games for a while. Just turn them off completely. But yet the night terrors continued to happen. Then they said, it's television. He's, his mind doesn't shut off. That's what they told my mom. His, it's like his mind keeps going. And, and so he falls asleep. His body physically falls asleep, but his mind is going so much that then his body starts to react. It's like a, like a chicken that's had his head cut off and it's still running around. Like he's asleep, but he's still running around because his mind can't stop. So you just need to turn off all the television, every television, every night. Don't let him have any television after five or six o'clock at night. No television. And we tried that. And guess what? I'm still having night terrors and running around the house like a crazed maniac at eight years, seven and eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old. I'm running around the house acting like a maniac every night. Maybe not every night, that's, that's exaggerated. But it was a lot. It was happening all the time, over and over and over again. And there, was, there seemed to be no fix for that. Today, I want to talk, the reason I want to talk about demonic activity, demonic possession and oppression and influence It's because I fear that there might be some people who might even be here that you're suffering and you've been looking for answers and saying, what in the world is going on? That's where I was. What is happening with me? And you've tried doctors and you've tried to, you've tried to have somebody help you. You've tried to look for other things. And I'm just going to tell you today from the onset that the Bible speaks of demons, of real actual being. And they do have some influence in our lives, even for the believers. You can't, I don't believe, I'm saying this from the beginning and I'll say it again in a little bit. I don't believe that a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have the Holy Spirit inside, I don't believe you can be possessed by a demon. And I'll show you why here in a little bit. But you certainly can be influenced. You can be affected by. You can be tormented by. That's possible. I'm going to show you this text today. I'm so glad that I just get to run into this and let the Lord lead these kinds of things. And I hope that I've got your attention. I hope you'll stick with me. I know that for some of you, you're devout Baptists and you're probably annoyed with me right now. And others of you think I'm crazy. But I hope you'll stick with me at least through the whole thing. At least hear what I have to say for today. Would you be willing to do that? Come on, go to Acts chapter 16 and look at verse 16. Do you have that? Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us. Who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, being greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city and they teach customs which are not lawful for us being Romans to receive or observe. And then the multitude rose up together against them and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had made, laid many stripes on them, they threw themselves, they threw them into, pri- into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Let's go to the Lord in prayer about this. Uh, Father, Lord, I pray that you would move in this place today. And Father, as as we talk about something that honestly, it's hard for us. 
Father, it's hard for me. I have human eyes and I see things from a human perspective with flesh and blood. But God, I trust you at your word and you've, I trust what I've seen in my own life. God, you've told us that we don't fight a battle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. Father, I pray that you would speak to us today. And I pray, Father, that if there is somebody here who is hurting and suffering, Father, I pray that they would see that your son Jesus is the answer. Would you move upon this place today, Father? Deliver those who need to be delivered. Save those who need to be saved. Call those who need to be called. We're asking for your presence, for your spirit. Father, we want to hear from you. We've come here today to hear from you. So I pray, Father, that you would speak. Father, let your word come alive to us. That we wouldn't just see it, but Father, that we would listen and we would react. Move in this place. We beg you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I want to start out just as a quick reminder that Paul and Silas and his friends, that's Luke and Timothy. Now, there's four guys. Do you remember that from last week? Remember Timothy? They had to get him circumcised, so he joined the group. And Luke's the guy writing the, the book of Acts. He's obviously joined the group because they're using these words like us when we went and, and she followed us. So the guy writing the book, he was present during this time. And so remember with me that they had gone, that Paul was going to go back out to go, go back out to visit the churches he had planted, but he had a big fight with Barnabas. And so Silas went with him. So Paul and Silas found Timothy and they, and Timothy and Silas and Luke and Paul, they've all gone out and they've gone through the city, they're going through city to city and they're planting churches and spreading the gospel, or at least they were trying. They got hindered and they couldn't go. The, the spirit kept hindering them and they couldn't, they couldn't preach the gospel where they thought they wanted to. And so do you remember what happened? Do you remember with me what happened? They, they had a vision. Does everybody remember the vision? Just shake your head, yes. They had the vision and they saw this guy in Macedonia. So they went to Macedonia, but they didn't find anybody yet. It had been some days. And then after some days, they went down to the river. They weren't familiar with Philippi. They didn't know anything. Philippi is in Macedonia. It's the foremost city of Macedonia. And so they don't know anything about the city, but they heard there's prayer happening down at the river. So they went down to the river and they met these ladies who were praying. And even though they were praying and even though they were religious, remember that Paul shared the gospel with them. Do you remember that? So now with me in verse uh, 16, so Acts 16 and verse 16, now it happened as we went to prayer. That's where they came from at least a week earlier. So it's been at least a week. At least one week later, they've been staying with this woman, Lydia. They're going to go back to this place of prayer. And on their way to the place of prayer, read these words with me. As we went to prayer, that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. They're on their way to prayer, and this girl starts following them. The Bible clearly says in this passage that this girl had a spirit of divination. I will come back to that in a moment. For just a little bit, would you entertain me and be willing to turn in your Bibles? If you don't have a Bible, I want you to watch the screen. I don't have a whole lot of time. I got a lot to get through. I know it's a short passage, but I got a lot to get through. So I'm not going to give you a ton of time to turn. If you can't get there, jot it down, watch the screen. We're going to put it up for you. But I'm going to turn. No opinion. I want you to pay attention. I'm telling you from the onset. I'm going to give you no opinion. I will in a little bit. I'll give you some opinion. But as I read this, note that I'm going to give you no opinion. I'm just going to read what the Bible says. You want to do that? Let's read this together. This is in Matthew chapter 9. So that's you turning if you want to go there. Matthew 9 and verse 32 and 33. Let's go ahead and pull that up because I'm going to get right to it. Matthew 9, 32 and 33. As they went out, behold, they brought to him a man mute and demon possessed. And when the demon was cast out of the, uh, cast out, the mute spoke. And the multitudes marveled, saying, it was never seen like this in Israel. Now, for sake of making it easy on you, let's just turn in Matthew. Stay right there in Matthew and turn to chapter 12. So you were in Matthew 9. Go on over to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew, look for the big 12 at the top of the page. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 22. 
So that's the little 22 in the middle of your page. Matthew 12, 22 and 23. You ready? Let's go ahead and pull that up. Then one who was brought to him was demon possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, could this be the son of David? Let's keep going. Stay in Matthew, but look over at chapter 17 and verse 14. Matthew chapter 17 and verse 14. Matthew 17 and 14, and we'll read all the way through verse 18. Matthew 17, 14. And when they had come the, to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. And so I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Let's do one more. You're going to go to the next book, but you're going to turn to the right. The next book of the Bible is Mark chapter 5 and verses 1 to 5. Mark, so one more book over, Mark 5 verses 1 to 5. And then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, that's Jesus, when he'd come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one could bind him, not even with chains, because when he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled, the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him, and always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself. I was in a Sunday school class about 15 years ago, I was in a Sunday school class and the teachers of that class began to talk about demons for whatever reason that day. I don't remember what the story, I don't remember what their lesson was. I just remember this part. As they began to talk about demons and they said something about demons, this guy in the front row goes, huh. And they said, what, why, why did you laugh? And he said, oh, come on. Do you all really believe that there's, there's, Ghouls and ghosts waiting around the corner to scare you at night. He's literally mocking them in front of the whole class. And they said, no, we don't believe there's ghouls and ghosts waiting to scare us at night. But we do believe that there are fallen angels. They have the name of a demon. We call them demons. And they do possess people. They do affect people's lives. They can mess with people. They can torment people. And he, at that point when they said that, literally laughed out loud. I'm talking like big, I couldn't mimic it right now. Just big old laugh out loud. The whole place is silent. There's probably 20 people in that room. This guy's laughing at the teachers. And so they said, okay, well, what do you believe about demons? The Bible speaks of demons. What do you believe about demons? And he said, a demon is like a vice. You know, if you, if you smoke and you can't stop smoking, that might be your demon. If, you, if you're on drugs and you can't get away from the drugs, that might be your demon. He said, if, if you're addicted to something, that, that's a demon. It's like a vice. Now, I'm asking you. I've given you no opinion, right? All I've done so far is read some scripture and then, and then told you a story about a Sunday school class. Are you keeping up with the order we've done? According to what you read, not my words, not my opinions, according to what you read, does the Bible picture demons as a vice? Does the Bible picture demons as a real entity? Does the Bible picture demons as something that can affect a human? That's no opinion of mine. I'm just reading what the Bible says. And the Bible says that there were people who were possessed with demons. And did you see all the different effects that were happening? For one guy, he's, he's got a demon and he can't speak. He was mute. Another guy had a demon and he couldn't speak or see. These are ones I just read to you. Another one had a son who was, had a demon and he was epileptic and he would fall and throw himself into the fire or into the water and try to hurt himself. Was that, did I make that up or was that in the text? You saw it, you read it. 
The boy had a demon, he was epileptic. You see another guy, he's got a demon and what's he doing? He's running around naked, in the, staying at the tombs, runs around naked and every night and day you can hear him howling as he's cutting himself. How many of our teenagers today suffer from cutting themselves? Did you re, am I telling a lie? Is that my opinion? Or did I just read a text that said he had a demon and he howled and cut himself? I want to now give you, I want to give you some, I want to take this deeper. At, in Acts chapter 16 and verse 16, it so happened as we went to prayer that there was a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination. Now, when I give you these, I hope that it has the effect on you that it had on me when I, when I looked these up. I just looked up each one of those words in the Greek. Were you able to get that, Josh? We can't get that. Okay, that's all right. It's hard to get Greek words up on the screen, so I don't know how to copy and paste those yet. Well, Jay will probably figure it out later, but, but you can just stick with me. If, you, if you're a strong person, you could look this number up. It's 2192 if you're taking notes today. The word is echo. She was possessed. That word is echo. That's how we would pronounce it. We'd say echo. That word echo in the Greek, that word literally means this. I'm just gonna read it. It says to have in, hand, in the hand. In the sense of wearing, to have possession of the mind. It refers to alarm, agitation, and emotion. Hold fast to have or compromise or involve, to regard or consider or to hold. Did you hear that word? That word possessed, it's like to have it, to wear it. Now, she didn't just have a demon in the sense of like she possessed the demon, she possessed the spirit. It's the other way around. The spirit is wearing her. Acts chapter 16 and verse 16, that she has the spirit and it, 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 she's possessed by it. She's held, that's the, that's the description. She's held by it. She's in its hand. It wears her. Now, what's the next word? It says that she was possessed with a spirit. That word spirit is the same type of word where we could get the word breath. It's pneuma, spelled with a P, like pneumatic. If you have pneumatic tools, those tools have air. They use air. That word literally means air or breath. That's the word that you get for the, the spirit. Remember the Holy Spirit of God when the Holy Spirit came into the, the upper room that day and clove in tongues like fire, and what did they hear was the sound of rushing wind, pneuma, that's, what they're, that's the sound of wind. That word pneuma in the Bible means spirit. And this is from, uh, this is from uh, James Strong. It's uh, an enhanced Strong's lexicon. So there's no number for this one, but the word is pneuma. And it's a spirit higher than man, but lower than God. An angel or used of demons or evil spirits who were conceived as inhabiting the bodies of men. Now, this last one, I think, is the most interesting. It says that she was possessed, held, or worn by a pneuma. So, echo pneuma. She was possessed or held by a spirit. And then, what's it say? It says that she, in verse 16, she was possessed by a spirit of divination. Now, what is that? Well, the word should sound familiar to you. It's pythonos or python. Have you ever heard of a python, like a ball python? told you I don't like snakes, but whatever. Y'all do you, okay? <laughs> it's just a joke. You have your snakes, whatever. But, but it's a, the word is pythonos or python. It comes from, there was a, a Greek god, and he was formed like a snake. His name was python, but that's not what the word means in the Greek. We, we stole that word for a python. I do think it's interesting that the spirit possessed her or held her, and a python is a constricting snake. I think that that's an interesting tie, but that's not what the word means. Pay attention to this one. This word, pythonos. Here's the, de here's the description of pythonos, a ventriloquist. The utterance being supposed to be due to the presence of a familiar spirit within the body of the speaker. Pythonos, it's a ventriloquist. Someone speaking on a puppet's behalf. All right, now stick with me. Here's where Justin's gonna start talking to you. All I've done so far is read you definitions, read you scriptures, but I hope that you'll pay attention to this because I'm, I'm gonna give you some good information. If you feel like there is something controlling you, it shouldn't be. The Holy Spirit of God should be the only thing that has control in your life. And if you feel like something takes over, that's not good. 
There was a young man that came to me and he was struggling with pornography addiction. First thing I told him is what I told everybody. I said, first thing you need to do is get rid of all the temptation. You need to throw away your phone, throw away your tablet, get rid of your computer. If it's really that important to you, get rid of it. And by the way, I hold to that. If you're a young man in here today, or a young woman for that matter, and you're struggling with pornography, there's a way to get rid of that. Get rid of all the stuff that you're using. It's so accessible to you. Get rid of it. This young man said he was struggling with pornography. I said, get rid of all the stuff. He said, you don't understand, Justin. Now pay attention to what he said to me. He said, I'll find a way. Something comes over me. He said, this way he told me, he said, I have been in the school library and I have to look. Something comes over me and I can't help it. Well, friends, that's a totally different thing and I hope you'll hear this pastor this morning. That's not natural. That's not normal. You're being affected. This girl was possessed she was, she was echo, pneuma, python. She was possessed by a spirit that was acting like a ventriloquist. She was not acting on her own behalf, but she was acting on the behalf of what something was controlling her to do. Now, can demons do that? Can a demon control you? Well, according to what I read earlier, they can cause it that a man couldn't speak, a man couldn't speak and couldn't see, a young man was epileptic and throwing himself in the fire, some guy was living naked among the tombs and cutting himself. Does that seem like a demon can affect you? It sure seems like it can. I mean, if I just read the Bible for what the Bible says, there are these spirits called demons that can affect you and they can cause you to do things. Now, how does that happen? Stick with me for just a second. First of all, I need to tell you how that happens like this. Well, let me look a little further at the text. Look at Acts 16 and now verse 17. There's this girl, she's echo, pneuma, python. She's possessed with the spirit of divination and she met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. In verse 17, this girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And and this she did for many days. You understand this girl's following them around and did you see what she's crying out? According to the text, what she says to these men as she follows them is that these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Now, I want to start with this. There's a thing that happens. We say, how does somebody end up with a a demon or an evil spirit? How does that happen? First of all, understand something. You can cause that. If you're messing around with witchcraft, if you're messing around with Ouija boards, I was in a, in a church service one time. It was an evening service. There's this old lady sitting behind me. I'm telling you, this lady's got to be like 85 or maybe even older. She is an older lady sitting behind me. Pastor says, you shouldn't be messing with Ouija boards. And out loud, I guess because she didn't have her hearing aid in, she goes, I play with Ouija boards all the time. If you're messing with Ouija boards, you're inviting spirits. If you're, if you're conducting seances, You're inviting spirits. If you're playing around with witchcraft. I knew a young lady. She was 17 years old. You know what she told me? She said, I like witchcraft because when I do things, things actually happen. Isn't that an interesting statement? Thank you. I was going to get there, but Jacob just said it for me. Did you hear what he said? Pornography. You want to know one of the biggest demons in our day and culture right now? It's the demon of pornography. And by the way, statistically, 90% of men are involved in it. Did you hear that number? 90% of men are inviting, are playing around with the demonic thing. How does this demon thing happen? How can somebody get it? Well, number one, I want to read you a scripture out of Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 17. Because Deuteronomy is way back towards the beginning. Fifth book of the Bible. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Chapter 32 and verse 17. If I said that too fast and you're taking notes. Deuteronomy 32, 17. And here's what it says. They sacrificed, listen to this, to demons, not to God. The gods they did not know, the new gods, the new arrivals that that your fathers did not fear. They're talking about the Israelite people. They were sacrificing. Did you see that? They thought they were sacrificing to a false god. They thought they were sacrificing to an idol. But according to Deuteronomy, they were sacrificing to a what? A demon. And I could give you bunches more of those scriptures. I won't turn you to them because it's not the main point. I hope you hear what I'm saying. If you're messing around with witchcraft and spiritual things, you're inviting demons into your life. You want to know why you're feeling the effects of that? Because you keep inviting it in. 
But friends, I need to tell you something. Everybody give me your attention because I think that's where the Christian has gotten stuck. I think for the most part, I am stressing for the most part, I would say 50% or more of the room probably understands, hey, I probably shouldn't be messing around with my horoscope, fortune tellers, witchcraft, Ouija boards. You probably don't do that. This is where everybody seems to stop. We, we know that those bad things can cause demonic oppression, possession, and influence in your life. I hope everybody's listening. Pay attention. It does not just have to be that you messed around with witchcraft that you end up with a demon messing with you. I hope you'll hear this. Demons and the devil, they don't know a low blow. They're not wait, they don't have to sit around, be polite, and wait for you to open up the door. That is not what they're waiting for. They're looking for any foothold. The Bible says that the devil throws fiery darts at you. You gotta put on the armor of God. It doesn't just say dodge the darts. It says put on the armor of God because they're coming. You see the difference of that? Ask yourself this question. When's the last time you heard somebody tell you this? There are other things besides witchcraft that'll bring a demon in your life. I'm gonna give you one right now. You know what happened to this poor girl? She was a slave girl. I don't hear anything about witchcraft or sacrificing to a, I don't hear anything about sacrificing to a, a demon from this girl. Maybe she did, but I don't know. But I'm gonna tell you this, you better hear this. You know what I've experienced personally? Trauma sometimes brings a demon in people's lives. Some poor girl, I'm, can I just be, I know there's kids in here. I hope I can just be real for, with you for a minute. But some poor girl gets raped and all of a sudden she's, she's, mess, she's being messed with by a demon. That's because the demon doesn't say I feel bad for her. He doesn't know a low blow. If he can get a foothold in, he's gonna get a foothold in. I hope you're hearing real stuff today. It doesn't just take that you mess with the spirit world for the spirit world to come mess with you. Sometimes it can happen that because the people that you live with and the situation that you're in, that they've been inviting demons in and it'll mess with you. Let me show you something. Look over now into the, into the book of 1 Timothy. Look at 1 Timothy chapter four and verse one. I told y'all before I'm a bad Baptist. I'll do this all day. 1 Timothy chapter four and verse one. 1 Timothy chapter four and verse one. Now the spirit says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Now, I just want to ask you this. Do you think there's anybody who's been coming to church, come to salt and light, singing will fall down, singing to God, truly praising, and all of a sudden they just turned around and wanted to go worship a pentagram? You think they were just like one day, like, you know what, this, this Jesus thing's not working out. I'll tell you what, I'd, I'd, rather have, I'd rather have eternal torment. Yeah, that sounds better. Does anybody think that way? Friends, it's, notice with me, it's a deceiving spirit. It's just for the person they were deceived, they thought they were doing the right thing. But they weren't doing the right thing. This girl is saying, these are, this is what I'm trying to get to. She's following them around in Acts 16 and verse 17. She's saying, these men are men of the most high. Is that true? Are they apostles of the most high God? That's a true statement. That's a good statement. She says, these men are trying to show us the way of eternal life. Is that a bad statement? Is that a lie? Why is this a problem that this girl is following them around and saying, these are servants of the most high God and they're gonna show us the way of eternal life? I hope everybody give me your attention because they're deceiving spirits. This spirit's already got this whole town fooled. People are paying money. Her masters are getting rich off of them selling her. She's possessed with a demon. She's a puppet. A ventriloquist demon is speaking for her. Python, you see what I'm doing there? Speaking for her. She has no control over that whatsoever. And the people are falling for it. Now the truth comes in. The way, the truth, the life. Jesus is the son of Nazareth. He's the son of God who died for you and rose for you. Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke, they're spreading the message of the gospel. And so what's the demon do? How do you combat the truth? He slipped in with a little bit of truth. This is what the devil's been doing all along. Hey, remember in the garden? There was a little bit of truth. Did God really tell you that you can't eat of any of the trees? He got Eve to correct him. No, 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 we can eat of all the trees, just not this one. There's a little bit of truth. Charles Spurgeon used to say, it's not, it's not, um, 
It's not discernment to be able to tell right from wrong. Even a baby can tell right from wrong. Even a little child can tell right from wrong. Discernment is when you can tell right from almost right. When there's right from almost right. I hope you're hearing me. How do you, how do sometimes, how do demons get in? Well, according to this, according to 1 Timothy 4 and 1, sometimes they're seducing spirits. They're doctrines of demons that turn you away from what God really said. Oh boy, I'm about to get really real. You know what a demon would love to convince you of right now? That he doesn't exist. You know what the devil would love to convince you of right now? That he's not a threat. You know what the enemy would, have, would do best with? If you, hang on, let's get real, if you would go to church and give a little bit of money and sing a song and go home and act like everything's good. But for some of you, everything's not good there and you know it's not good there. And if he can convince you that this guy's crazy and this is just an ancient text and it really doesn't mean anything, if he can convince you that he's not real, guess who keeps his foothold? Guess who continues to mess with you? This girl had a seducing spirit. She had a spirit of divination. She was used to giving a little bit of truth. This, this divination, this, this spirit that's inside of her gives people a little bit of truth. Of course it can. That spirit can see in the spirit world. It can see things that, that we can't see. So it reveals there are things that you and I and human eyes, we can't see. And then maybe those things happen and everybody validates her. Look, look how real she is. Look how true she is. How could this be wrong? She's told us things that no one would ever know. Of course, none of us would know it because we're humans. We got human eyes. But a demon who doesn't, not bound by a, a body like we are, he knew things that, he knew things that they didn't know. So imagine being a guy going to this girl and paying money and saying, tell me, and she, said, and she tells him something that he did the night before behind closed doors. And so then when she tells them, well, now I want you to do whatever, they'd follow it. When he says, go to the temple of Python and go worship, they would follow. Would that be convincing if he just told you, if this little girl just told you something that you did the day before, the night before, a year before, something nobody else knew? If she told you that and then said, go worship at the spirit of Python, at the, at the temple of Python, wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be a, a way to get you away? It's a deceiving spirit. It's a deceiving demon. Now look at this. I gotta show you this. Well, look over at 2 Corinthians 11. Look at 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 13 and 15. 1 Corinthians 11, 13 and 15. I'm gonna go ahead and go because I, I, I've got other things to do this morning. So first, 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transform, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if, he, if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Oh, boy, this just got really real, didn't it? That's a little different than, oh, you messed around with a Ouija board, because that says that there are people who are actually trying to infiltrate the enemy wants to infiltrate. He wants to tell you a message that's not God's message. He wants to get you to hear his message. And how do they do it? Do they do it by standing there with a, a red cape and a pitchfork? Do they do it by, by creeping around at night and scaring you and shutting doors? Do you see what I'm saying? How'd they get in? By false teachers who set themselves up as apostles of Christ has set themselves up. They, they made it look like we're doing good things. Oh boy. Who's ready for Justin to get really real? How many groups, how many groups are acting like they do good things, but they've got seducing spirits? You ready? The Masons are one of them. You wanna know how you're being messed with with a demon? The Masonic Lodge. 
I've, I'm telling you firsthand experience. I've experienced myself. I had a guy bring me his, his certificate from the lodge, signed with his blood. I saw it with my own eyes in the old church office, brought it to me with tears in his eyes, and he cried to me because every time he went to a meeting, he bowed down and kissed a ring and called that man worshipful master. Oh, but they collect money for Cosairs. Uh-oh. He said it. But they do the fireman thing. They're like outside, they've got fireman boots and you put your change in, right? Friends, I'm all about helping kids at a hospital, but hear me. How, I'm answering a question. How is it that a demon can end up messing with you? Friends, if you're part of the Masonic Lodge and you've been messing around with that, you've been kissing some guy's ring, calling him worshipful master. Here, you, you want me to reveal something? You've been knocking on a door and saying, I'm in the darkness, bring me into the light. That's what y'all do in the lodge. Not all of you, some of you ladies, like we couldn't even go to the lodge. That's okay, y'all got the Eastern Star. Y'all to stay out of that too. Boy, I'm just calling them all out. And inside of the church are seducing spirits. Pastors and teachers who know nothing of the gospel of Christ, but they want their paycheck. They want the fame and the notoriety. And they stand in front of their congregations and they convince them that they have a message from God because they get almost right. But friends, the message is always the same and I'm gonna take you there right now. Look a little further. Look what happens next in verse 18. So I'm in Acts chapter 16 and verse 18. I hope, I hope you're with me. Are you with me? And this she did, come on, you can clap. This she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. Wait a second, this is Paul. Why did Paul say exactly what he said? This girl's following them around for days. These are servants of the Most High God. They tell us the way of eternal life. Paul whips around one day and finally goes, I am telling you, get out of her in the name of Jesus. And the Bible says the Spirit came out of her. What happened there? You ready for this? Everybody give me your attention because I'm about to give you the answer. You tormented, you got struggles, you know that you're messing with, de demons are messing with you, you know you got stuff in your house, you know you got stuff in your life, you want an answer, I'm gonna give you the real answer. You don't need to buy a cloth, you don't need to buy a handkerchief, you don't need to buy some holy water, you don't need to spend one dime. Here's what you need. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said, you can clap. Paul said, Paul said, I command you because I'm an apostle. Say no. No, you say no. <laughs> Y'all got lost. I, that was my bad. It was a bad teacher moment. Paul, Paul said, you come out because I'm an apostle. So if you're hearing people tell you they got to be an apostle to get a demon out, they lied to you. Because Paul, who was a real apostle, who saw the risen Jesus Christ, saw him and, and had a vision of him when he was there on the road to Damascus, that same Paul said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out. How does the demon come out? In the name of Jesus Christ. Now pay attention, you better pay attention to this. In three chapters, we're gonna get to a different story. I don't have time today for every story. I can't do everything. In three chapters, we'll get to this again and I'll tell you more about it then. But there's these guys, the seven sons of Sceva, and they decide they're gonna cast a demon out. Come to find out, they were Jewish men who did not know Jesus. And the demon looks at them and goes, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but you I don't know. And one demon-possessed guy strips seven guys naked, beats them up and kicks them out the door and these seven sons of Sceva go running down the street naked. It's in Acts chapter 19. Go read it for yourself if you want. We'll get there in a few weeks though. You better hear this. It is not invoking the name of Jesus. It is not merely saying his name is like a, some sort of a magic rabbit's foot, some sort of a charm. If you just say his name right, if you've got the right words, if you, it's, not the, it's not the combination of I command you in the name of Jesus Christ. It's not a combination of words. It's not even really just the fact that he used those words. Friends, it's the fact that Paul, the apostle, had a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you are tormented, there's a way out. 
And it's not an answer that Justin can, can hit you in the head and I can knock you on the floor. It's not because we could speak in tongues. It's not because we obey the Sabbath day. It's not because you ordered some hanker, handkerchief for $50 and got a book and a handkerchief and you're gonna read the book and pray on the handkerchief. Don't be mad at me if you've done those things. I'm, I'm just trying to help you. If you want the real answer, the real answer is this. Jesus Christ is the son of God. Yeah. And he came to this earth and he paid for your sin. Like he took your sin, he took it upon himself and he went to the cross and they killed him. He died. He died to pay your price of sin. That's why he died on the cross. But friends, the gospel is not that Jesus died on the cross. If you don't know this, let me clarify for you. Easter's coming. Jesus died on the cross and they put him in a tomb. But guess what happened three days after they put him in the tomb? You know it, what'd he do? He rose. Death couldn't hold him. Friends, now stick with me, pay attention to this. Not everybody's got a demon, right? There's probably lots of you in the room today don't have a demon. Would you agree with that? But everybody faces death. There's not one person in this room that doesn't face death one day. Jesus beat that. Jesus is stronger than death. I don't know if y'all caught it, but back at, uh, back at Christmas, I had some guys come up and give testimony. And one of our guys came up, his name was Evan. I hope he's okay with me telling this. I think he might be here today. It's okay if he's not, I'm gonna tell it anyways. Evan said something and right in the middle, he just said it, he glazed over it. And I don't know if anybody even caught it. I was like, what a powerful line. Here's what he said. He said, I've never seen any demon kick Jesus out. Ho, 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 ho. Let that sink in. I ain't never seen anybody with Jesus and a demon kick Jesus out, but Jesus is stronger than the demons. You want an answer? And it's Jesus. He died for you and he rose for you. He conquered death for you. So if you're being tormented, he can run that stuff out. You don't have to suffer under demonic oppression or torment anymore because Jesus is the answer. I'm gonna stop right there and I'm gonna invite my buddy to come up here. Chip's his name. You guys know, would you just give a hand to Chip for being willing to come up here and share? We're, things are gonna be a little different today. I just wanna tell you all, when we get done, Chip's gonna speak. He's gonna grab a mic and Chip's gonna speak. And he's gonna give you some testimony of when he was pastoring a church and when they anointed people with oil and when they began to pray for those for deliverance, he's gonna give you some testimony. But I wanna tell you this, when we're done with that, the band, if you guys would go ahead and come on up, um, I mean, like now, like, you know, come on up. The band's gonna play a song when he's done. This is not our only invitation. We'll have invitation at the end, but I'm, I'm gonna ask our elders and our deacons, and if you're a prayer war, warrior with us and you wanna come over this way, if I could actually get people on either side, if you want us to pray for you today, if, you've been, if you know that you're struggling, if you know you need deliverance, if you're saying, Justin, I feel like you're talking right to me, friends, I can't talk to you, I don't even, how, how many of you did I come up to you today and you were like, we met nine months ago? How many of y'all came in here today and I, and I, I was like, this is the first time you're here and you've like, been coming for a month. I didn't know you are gonna be here. I, don't, I can't hardly remember your names. There's so many of us anymore. So I'm telling you, I'm not talking to you. I, can't, I don't know what's going on in your life. If you feel like somebody's talking to you, listen to the Holy Spirit of God. And if you need deliverance today, come down. We're gonna be willing to pray for you. We'll anoint you with oil if you wanna do that. We'll do it during the song that, that they play right after Chip gives us some testimony. So I hope you guys will give me your attention. I was a pastor for 14 years and about four or five years into that ministry, <clears throat> I was reading through the book of Acts and uh, I'm not Acts, James, James chapter five, it says, if any of you are sick, have the elders pray over them, anoint them with oil. I don't really understand why, but that's what it says. And one day I stood in front of our church and I said, you know, we don't do this. We've never done this, but it's in the Bible and our church believed the Bible. So I said, we're gonna do this today. And the first lady that we prayed over uh, the worship team was playing and this lady came forward. She had been struggling with depression, severe depression for about 10 years. She did not want to go on antidepressants. They had spent over $40,000 on natural treatments. And she came forward and the day she came forward, she had white gauze around her wrist. She had been cutting herself just a couple days before. And this was, uh, I think she was probably in her late 20s at the time, maybe early 30s. But she was strong in the word of God in prayer. She really was. 
She had had, like Justin mentioned, a traumatic experience, the exact same one that he did mention, uh, when she was in college, and after that time, she struggled with depression for about 10 years. So there were four of us elders that anointed her head with the oil. I don't really know what that means. We just made sign of a cross on her forehead, and uh, we just prayed like Jesus prayed. He, he spoke to the demons. We just said, if there's any darkness manipulating this lady, we command you to leave in Jesus' name. Very simple prayer. Um, that was the first day that she experienced joy in 10 years. And she waited two days to call and tell me. And believe me, I jumped and danced around my living room. Um, I was so excited about it, but she was afraid it wasn't real. But uh, two days later, she called me and she said, I think I've been healed. And so we were just encouraged to keep doing that. Um, we began to see God do lots of different things. People healed of different things. Um, there was one young lady. She was a teenager. I think she was about 17 at the time. She was struggling with an eating disorder, anorexia. She was very thin. And they didn't attend our church, but she came that Sunday. They had kind of heard God doing some things at our church. And so... After the service, we anointed her with the oil. We prayed the same way. If there's any darkness manipulating her, we command you to leave in Jesus' name. And I didn't feel anything. I didn't see anything, experience anything. They left. And a couple weeks later, her mom called me and said, I think my daughter's been delivered of that. She's already put on a couple pounds, which was significant for her, very significant. This had been going on in her life for about six years. She'd already put on a couple pounds, and she said, after the service, we walked out to the parking lot, and my daughter said to me, Mom, I felt something leave me. Six months later, I happened to run into that same girl, and she was actually overweight, and she eventually came back to her set weight, but she was delivered. And so we, we began to pray over people. Um, there was another lady and I that were pray, was praying over a lady that um, was very badly affected by a horror movie. And she had depression. She was on antidepressants. Um, so the, the two of us prayed over this lady. And sometimes th there's no magic formula for this. For whatever reason, this lady just felt like all this pressure in her nose while we were praying. And so she began to blow her nose. And somehow doing that made her feel like this thing came out. And uh, she was healed of her depression. What I didn't know was the lady that was praying with me over this lady, this lady was an on antidepressants. She was taking Prozac, and she went home that day and took her Prozac. After we had been praying over this other lady, she went home, took her Prozac, and immediately threw it back up. She waited about four or five hours and tried to take it again. Immediately, she threw it back up, and she went off of that drug cold turkey that day. So uh, God began to, to, to do a lot of these different things. Um, just two more quick stories. There was one lady that prior to coming to Christ had been uh, significantly sexually immoral. And um, my wife was there. We were praying over her and we were just by name praying over people uh, that she had been with, uh, asking God's forgiveness for each one and casting out anything that may have come in through that sexual immorality. And each time we prayed over her, and mentioned a name, it sounded like a belch was coming up. There was nothing that came out, but we audibly heard something coming up every time we mentioned a name. So it's, it's not always this same formula. Um, the last thing I just want to share with you is uh, uh, I went through Trinity School of Natural Health, and uh, that school had very good beginnings, uh, Christian beginnings, but by the time I went through it, there was a lot of New Age practices, even I would just call it... We, call it new age, but it was witchcraft uh, that was involved in there. And I will tell you, it's, it's not that it doesn't work. That stuff does work, uh, but it does open you to demons. And um, I went through that school. After I had graduated, there was an, a, a new teacher that came in, and she was nationally known. She was a new age guru. They brought her in. She was a nationally known healer. So, um, she's friends with people that are, are big name people today. Um, and I was just like, wow, this lady, I was watching her stuff on Facebook, and I was like, man, she is so new age. I was like, I just don't, I just remember thinking to myself, I don't want anything to do with that lady. And then Heather and I were at this naturopathic convention, and there she was at this booth for Trinity School of Natural Health. And I, and I, I met her, and I just was like, I just don't, I don't even want to be around that lady. Um, and then 
one day I happened to see her post on Facebook, and it was the most God-honoring, glorifying thing to Jesus Christ that I had ever seen. I mean, it was just, and since then, Jesus, 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 just lifting the name of Jesus. And I was just like, what happened? So I reached out to her, a private message to her, and um, I was like, you got to tell me what happened because I didn't want anything to do with you, and now you're all about Jesus. And she said, here I was, this nationally known teacher. I was teaching at a, a, a naturopathic school. People sought out my advice, and she's like, I got so sick, and I couldn't fix it. It was this debilitating lack of energy, couldn't get out of bed, and she was having these extremely demonic dreams, just super dark, scary dreams. And she had a friend that was a Christian that told her, you have a demon. And they cast this thing out of her. Long story short, all of her symptoms were gone. Her dreams were gone. She had the most delightful dreams that night after this thing. And I will just tell you this, um, you know, some people are, have doubts about whether Jesus is real, the spiritual realm is real, but people that have, had, have seen the name of Jesus cast other things out, they know that Jesus is real. They know that he's powerful. <laughs> Let me just share one last thing. Um, I, you know, Christians can be oppressed and... I don't think it's possessed, but I, um, Heather and I were serving at a camp after we, we were at a, a Christian college, and this was a, a camp that was associated with that college. And the guy there that was a student, this is Wheaton College, but he was an atheist. He just somehow lost his faith in college, and he was still at this camp supposedly leading kids in their faith, but he had kind of told some people, I don't really believe in God, I don't believe any of this is real. Well, they're one of his campers, one of the kids, this 14-year-old kid that that came was demonically possessed and had that type of strength where he was literally taking his fingernails and clawing grooves into the the wood. And it scared this guy. And they, there was a bunch of them that got on top of this boy, took about four or five grown men to hold him down. And they cast this thing out. And that, that guy that was the camp counselor that was an atheist was back in the Jesus camp. Like he knew this is real. And I would just encourage you, um, be very careful about things that you open yourself to. There's a lot of stuff parading uh, as Christian and different types of healing and pendulums and chakras and all these, these type language. And be very careful. You're opening yourself to the enemy. Stick close to Jesus. The only thing that I know in this world anymore that's true is the Bible. Thank you. I just want to share with you real quick. I just want to share with you something. So 13 years old, I got a call from my cousin. And he said, Justin, I heard that you've been having night tears. And I told him, I said, yeah. And by the way, I never talked to my cousin. He lived in Virginia. His name was James. He was 19. I was 13. We just didn't know each other. He said, Justin, he said, I heard you've been suffering from night tears. I said, I have. And he said, I heard you guys have been trying all kinds of things. And I said, I have. And he said, did you know I I suffered the same thing when I was about 10? And I said, I I didn't know that. And he said, somebody came to me and he said, they were brave enough to tell me that what was going on was that I had a demon that was messing with me. And he said, I think that that might be what's going on with you. And he said, Justin, I'm telling you, he said, this is what happened with me. All I can do is share my testimony. He said, he said, I could feel it at night. I could, I knew it was going to happen. It was like, I could feel something creeping before it would happen. And I said, that's exactly what I would feel. And he said, Justin, he said, if you're a believer, do you believe in Jesus? And I said, I do, I believe in Jesus. And he said, if you're a believer in Jesus, then you don't have to suffer that. And he told me this, he said, this is what he said. He said, no more Gatorade, no more trying to turn off the TV at five o'clock. He said, when you feel that, tell it that it has no authority over you in the name of Jesus, who's your master, that he has control, Jesus has control over you. Tell it to go away in the name of Jesus. And I'm gonna tell you this true story. We had these bunk beds. They were like, there was like a bunk bed this way and this way and then one that went atop. My oldest brother was on top. My brother Chris was here beside me. And that night I could feel something creeping at me and I knew and I stood up and I said, 
with my brothers right there. I thought I was going to wake him up. And I was just so desperate to be done with it. I said, I, you have no authority over me. And I command you to go away in the name of Jesus. And I'm telling you now, I'm 38 years old. Now listen, I had a grand mal seizure. I died for four minutes. I had night terrors for five years and couldn't stay the night at a friend's house until I was almost 13 years old. And here's a true story. I've never had one since. Not ever one. There's a story in the Bible of a guy, we've read a little bit, he was cutting himself and howling. Jesus asked the demon his name. He said, we're legion because we're many. I don't think you have to know the demon's name. That's not the point. Jesus was stronger than all of them. That's the point. And Jesus commanded the demons to go out of the man. They ran into the pigs. And the man was in his right mind and he was dressed and he was sitting at the fire and eating with Jesus. And the town saw the man that used to cry and cut himself in his right mind. And I was going to turn you to it, but we don't have time. But, but listen, the town was scared of the man because he was in his right mind. And they asked Jesus to leave because the man was in his right mind. I know that in a room this size, there's some of you there looking at me and going, he's crazy. That's fine. You can think I'm crazy. I'm just trying to tell you the truth about Jesus. Jesus is better than the angels. He's better than the Sabbath. He's better than all the sacrifices. He's bigger. He's stronger. And whatever you're dealing with, he's bigger and stronger than that. And I want you to do today, I want you to do what the people in that town didn't do. Don't ask him to leave. Ask him to come in. That's what he wants. He wants a relationship with you. Would you put your faith in Jesus Christ today? I'm gonna, it's, I know you all have to go and I always wanna be respectful of that. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna pray. And if you wanna receive Christ as your savior, do that now. Make it happen right now. Do not leave this place without Christ being king of your life. We're not gonna do an, we're not gonna do an invitation time. If you wanna come see us, we'll be down here. I'm not going anywhere. But for those of you who need to leave, you'll be dismissed after this prayer. But if you wanna come and see us, come down and come talk with us. We'll pray for you. We'll pray for your deliverance. We'll pray for your healing. And if you need Jesus, friends, you can have him. If you need to be saved, you can be saved right now, today. And that's what we're gonna ask God for. Father, take this place over. You already have. Father, you're already working. We want to say, first of all, God, thank you for the testimonies that are about to happen. For those who are going to come back in a week, in two weeks, in a year, and say it's never happened again. Father, we thank you for working in our midst. We thank you, Father, for inviting us into a kingdom that we can't yet see. And that we can defeat the enemy that we can't see. May your name be glorified because you are good and you are powerful and you are strong and you are king and you are creator and your savior. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you for this time. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of it. Father, I pray that if there's somebody here that doesn't know your son, Jesus, lay that on them. Father, affect them. Draw them unto yourself. Show them that you are the only way to true life. The broad way leads to destruction, but the narrow way, which is Christ and only Christ and nothing else, one path is completely open to all who would call upon his name. Bless us today, Father, with salvation and deliverance in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.